So we're at the stage of just doing the last operation for our modular arithmetic logarithms. Exponentiation is easy. Well, easy in terms of concept. That is, it's repeated multiplication and in terms of how we think about exponentiation, you take uh, your number, raise it to the power, mod by n, you get your answer. So conceptually easy. In practice, time consuming sometimes to calculate. We'll see some examples when we have big numbers. Last one, logarithms. And the concept we have is a discrete logarithm. In normal arithmetic, if we have b equals a to the power of i, i is the index or the exponent, then the log in base a of b is i, that index or exponent. But now we have everything mod n, or in this, this uh, equation, mod p. So if we have b equivalent to a raised to the power of i, all in mod p, then we say, in the same concept, the logarithm in base a with mod p of b equals i, the index. So we're trying to find the index of this ex exponentiation, the opposite of the exponentiation operation. And we call it, for modular arithmetic, a discrete logarithm. If we go back to multiplication, in modular arithmetic we can do multiplication for all numbers, but we cannot do division for all numbers. And similar follows, we cannot do logarithms for all numbers. There's only special cases where we can determine the unique exponent. So we need to introduce a primitive root to explain that. So a primitive root is of some so we define a primitive root of some prime p, a prime number p, if a number is a primitive root of that prime p, then a raised to the power of 1, 2, 3, up until p minus 1 gives us distinct values. And that's best shown with some examples. So we'll go to, straight to some examples to introduce the concept of a, tr a primitive root. And then see the discrete logarithm relies on uh, a primitive root being found. I have some better examples, I hope. Let's say our modulus is... Everything is mod 7 for this set of examples, mod se 7. So in our equation, mod p, well, p is 7. Let's look at the numbers when we take some number a and we raise it to some power i. where i ranges from, for mod 7, 1 up until 6. Let's start simple, a equal to 1. So, we're trying to give an example of a primitive root. A primitive root of some prime or some number p is that if we can take that primitive root, raise it to the powers of 1, 2, 3, up until p minus 1, if the answers are distinct, different values. Let's try some values. So, what we're going to do is take our value a, raise it to the power of i, and then mod by our modulus p, which in this case is 7 for this example. So, a to the power of i mod 7. So 1 to the power of 1 mod 7, we get what? 1. 1 to the power of anything, we're going to get 1. So this is going to be a simple case. We'll write the answers here just to demonstrate. a equals a 1 i equal to 1, 1 to the 1, mod 7, answer is 1. 1 to the power of 2, mod 7, also 1. 1 to the power of 3, mod 7, 
we can see what we're going to get as answers. We'll come back to that one and let's try for a different value of a and then explain what they mean. What if a equals 2? So what we do, when we're mod 7, consider 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, and so on, mod 7. What are the answers? 2 to the power of 1, mod 7, is 2. 2 to the power of 1 is 2, mod 7, we get 2 as the answer. 2 to the power of 2, mod 7, How about we, uh, I'm very lonely up the front. Come down closer, everyone. Small, small group of students, large room. Move down the front. It's okay to eat. Everyone move down the front. Front two rows. It's okay. We've got time. Off you go. Yeah, everyone move. I can't move the screen closer to you. Come on. The front three rows. It's okay. It's all right. Just for today, front three rows. Yes, everyone, not not just uh, two or three people. Just try something different. It's okay. Bring your laptop. <laughs> it's not too hard. Just just move down the front. The front a little bit closer. There's so many seats to choose from. Okay. Now I can ask a question and hear your answers. 2 to the power of 2, mod 7. What's the answer? 4. 2 to the power of 3, mod 7. 2 to the power of 3 is 8, mod 7, we get 1. 2 to the power of 4, mod 7. Try it. 2 to the power of 2, mod 7, we get 4. 2 to the power of 3, mod 7, we get 1. 2 to the power of 4, mod 7. 2 to the power of 4 is 16, mod 7, the answer is 2. 2 to the power of 5, mod 7. 2 to the power of 5 is 32, mod 7, 4. 2 to the power of 5 is 32, 4 times 7 is 28, remainder is 4. 2 to the power of 6, mod 7. 1. Check. 2 to the power of 6 is 64. 9 times 7 is 63, so the remainder is 1. Okay, easy. Maybe it's so easy when you're sitting down the front too, so let's do this one. What if A is 3? 3 to the power of 1, mod 7, easy, 3. 3 to the power of 2 is 9, mod 7. 3 to the power of 3, mod 7. 3 to the power of 3 is 27, mod 7, 6. 3 to the power of 4, I'll give you A calculator. You can use your head, fine. What do we have? 3 to the power of 4, mod 7. Sorry, that's 4. What's the next one? 3 to the power of 5, mod 7. 5. 
Okay, so this is doing it for us. So the, this one was 3 to the power of 4 mod 7, we got 4. 3 to the power of 5 mod 7, 5. 3 to the power of 6 mod 7, let's use our calculator. 1. Okay? Nothing hard there. Now, why do we do that? Our modulus is prime 7, p is 7. A primitive root of 7 is a number when we raise it to a power of all the integers up until that number 7, but less than, we get distinct answers. So we say 3 is a primitive root of mod 7. With 2, we get non-unique values in this set of answers. 2 occurs twice, 4 and 1 occurs twice. With a equal to 3, when we mod raise to the power of i and mod by 7, we get this distinct set of 6 values. So we say a is a primitive root. Two and one are not in this case. And then we can try for other numbers. So that's the definition of primitive root. We use it to do to work out when a discrete logarithm is possible. The idea is that a discrete logarithm, coming back, remember logarithm. Find the find the exponent or index. That's a logarithm. Given the base. And the answer, find the index that when we raise the base to that index, we get the answer b. Same with discrete logarithm, but everything is mod p. With some base i, if we mod p and get the answer b, what is the index i? Sorry, some base a. Base is a, mod is p, the answer is b, then the index is i. Well, we can only solve such value and get a unique exponent i, that is, get an answer that's unique, if a, the base, is a primitive root of prime p. So that's the conditions when our discrete logarithm will work. Let's give an example. we got what is this discrete log in base 3 mod 7 of 6 the way we read that is that 3 raised to some power, to some index, mod by 7 give us an answer, gives us an answer 6. So what is that index? 3 raised to some number, then we mod by 7 gives us 6. What is that number? Where do you get the number from? We just calculated it, didn't we? Three raised to the power of some number mod seven. This table we calculated, or these values calculated with mod seven, gives us an answer six. So what's the index that gives us an answer six? Three. So the answer of this is three. And we can check, you can check that, that is 3, the base, to the power of the answer, 3, mod 7. 3 to the power of 3 is 27, mod 7 gives us 6. Okay, that one's fine. Discrete log of base 
2, mod 7 still, of 4. The discrete logarithm of 4 in base 2 mod 7 means 2 to the power of some number, 2 to the power of some number mod 7 gives us the answer of 4. What is that number? What is the index? What, what do we have as possible answers? Yeah, we just calculate it again. We just calculated it for the values when we mod by 7, we calculated it. the base is 2, raised to the indexes of 1 through to 6, mod by 7, we get the answers 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1. In this question, we have what do we have? 2 to the power of discrete log of 4. So what index gives us an answer of 4? There are two possible values. 2 to the power of 2 mod 7 gives us 4. 2 to the power of 5 mod 7 also gives us 4. We don't have a unique value and therefore we cannot determine what the index was originally. There's no way to know which index was it if we want to do uh, a discrete logarithm. There's no unique answer here. Why? Because the base is not a prim primitive root of 7. So when the base, this value, is a primitive root of the modulus, then we can get a unique answer because we have a distinct set of values here. But when the base like 2 is not a primitive root of 7, then we will not get a unique exponent because we have multiple instances of the answer. So what's the answer? Well, we say there is no answer or no unique answer. Not of interest to us. Well, there are two possible answers. But generally we'd like to get a unique value, especially when we apply to encryption. So. When we want to use the discrete logarithm, we normally need to have the base to be a primitive root of the modulus. In this case, it's not. And we'll see algorithms, cryptographic algorithms, that use this concept. So again, all we did was, for our example, when we're using mod 7, we said, well, given the values 1 up until 6, the set of exponents, if a to the power of i, these are the possible values of i, when we mod by 7, if we take all values of a, which values, when we raise to the power of i, give us a unique set here? 3 does, 2 doesn't, 1 doesn't, and you can check the others whether they do or not. If they do, it's called a primitive root. And if we have a primitive root in this case, we can solve the discrete logarithm with a unique answer. Not all... Okay, and some useful values. The only integers with primitive roots are listed here. 2, 4, and some prime raised to some integer. Any prime raised to the integer. p to the power of 1, p to the power of 2, and 2 times that value. So there's only some numbers have primitive roots. And that restricts us when we want to find a discrete logarithm. So when we want to use the discrete logarithm in a cryptographic algorithm, we must choose our numbers carefully. So for now, just be aware what is a primitive root. A primitive root of some prime p is a number such that when we raise it to the powers up until p minus 1, we get distinct answers when we mod by p. What is a primitive root? And that for a discrete logarithm, we can only find a unique exponent if the base, A, 
is a primitive root of the prime p. So that's what we need to know for now. Now, we say we can find the answer. Another thing we'll see later, maybe not today, solving the discrete logarithm can be complex. Complex enough if you use large enough numbers, practically impossible. That is, if you spend your uh, 10 million years trying to solve it, you will not get an answer. It will take too long. So that will be a property that we take advantage of later. But we'll return to that when we use it. This is using mod 19 as a different example. We had an example of mod 7. If we have mod 19, what are the primitive roots of 19? And this is a table similar to what we calculated. This is the values of a, and then a to the squared, cubed, up to a to the power of 18, up to p minus 1. How many primitive roots of 19 are there? There are six. And this, these grey boxes highlight. Look at the, the answers. When we raise the power in mod 19, the grey boxes highlight the unique set of values. A primitive root is one that gives us a unique set of values which is distinct amongst all 18 in this case. One, two, three, four, five, six possible primitive roots. They are 2, 3, 10, 13, 14 and 15. And in mod 19, some discrete logarithms. So the answers have been calculated for us. So in base 2, base 3, 10, 13, 14, 15, base of the primitive root, mod 19. So for example, <coughs> log in base 13, mod 19 of 8 is 15. That's how we read this table. The log, or the discrete log of the top row, the answer is the, the second row. And the base is 13 here, mod 19. The base here, 14, mod 19. So the base are the six different primitive roots. Generally, I do not ask you to solve a discrete logarithm in a quiz or an exam unless I give you some extra supporting information. So especially with large numbers, they're not solvable with large enough numbers, there are no known algorithms that can solve the discrete logarithm in reasonable time. With small numbers, you can do it with trial and error. Okay, you can find a way to do it, but if it's large enough, it will take too long. And this, actually, this is the last point on this slide. With certain problems, when the numbers are large enough, it takes too long to be able to solve those problems. And we'll take advantage of that fact when we use some of this mathematics in, in public key cryptography. Three problems that we will see that arise, which are what we see computationally hard, meaning if the numbers are large enough, it'll take forever to get the answer. Interfactorization. That is, given some integer n which was calculated by multiplying two primes together if n equals p times q p and q are prime numbers large prime numbers if I give you n it'll take you forever to find p and q if you don't know them that's the problem there there's no known algorithm that will take n and factor it into its two primes in reasonable time. Uh, one example of a large number, uh, one maybe five or so years ago now, a number n which was, the number n was 768 bits long, or 232 decimal digits. So write a number 232 digits, given that number, <coughs> factor it into its two primes p and q, Several years ago, it took someone uh, something like 2,000 uh, computer or man years to, to do that factorization. 
So if you make it longer, it will effectively take forever. Sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, NP, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't know for all of them. I think interfactorization. Uh, Euler's totient, I'm not sure. Uh, in practice, um, too large. Whether it's NP, uh, what's the difference? NP complete, NP hard. Uh, I don't remember for all of those algorithms. So there's some slight subtle differences in the, the non-polynomial algorithms. Uh, and effectively they are. But there's some variations. So some are easier than others. Okay. But yes, effectively, all of these algorithms, we cannot solve them in reasonable time if we have a large enough input. The input for Euler's Totion is, or the problem is, given n, just n, a non-prime n, a composite n, find the totient. Remember the totient was the, the count of numbers less than n which are relatively prime with n. We could do it, we could, okay, if n was 20, the 1, 2, 3, up to 19, check which numbers are relatively prime with n. But now make n a thousand bits long, like hundreds of digits, and then find the answer. It's considered harder than inter integer factorization. With the same size n, it would take you longer to do this and this. So this one may take a million years, this may take two million years, but effectively unsolvable. Similar discrete logarithms with large enough values, finding the index is considered unsolvable. So if you know the base, the modulus, and b, finding the discrete logarithm uh, is impossible. We'll come back to them and see how they're used in cryptography. And that's our next topic. So let's get to it. Any questions before we move away from the theory onto the application in, in security? Next topic, public key cryptography. What have you done? Crashed. So all of the security schemes we've seen up until t today have been symmetric key cryptography. Encrypt with one key, decrypt with the same shared secret key. Now we're using to, moving to a different approach, public key cryptography. Let's look at the principles and then an example. So it's reported that around the 1960s, the NSA in the US discovered the concepts or developed the concepts for public key cryptography. Similar organization in the UK uh, uh, around the same time or the 1970s, that's the first known report. But it was only made public in 1976 two guys, Diffie and Hellman, come up with this idea of public key cryptography. So that was the first that the public knew of this concept. Uh, and it was only till later that NSA and, and uh, the government headquarters in, in the UK started to advertise that they already knew about it. So it's only been around for what, 40, 50 years. Caesar cipher has been around for, what, 2,000 years. So it's relatively new. The idea is to use two different keys for our encryption and decryption, not using a shared secret key. The motivation of Diffie and Hellman to come up with this idea was to, when you use secret key encryption, you often rely on someone generating the key for you and giving you the key. You often need to trust someone else with a key to make it easy to distribute. They wanted to develop a way to avoid relying on other organizations to, to trust with your key. And so you can do it just direct between two users. And to do things like digital signatures, which is someone can take some document, say electronic file, and attach their signature to it, 
such that at a later time anyone can prove that it came from that person. That's your idea of a signature. You sign a document, the concept is that later someone can see that document and prove that it came from you, that you have approved that document because it's got your signature on it. They wanted to, to provide this functionality and they come up with public key cryptography. So the principles. Symmetric algorithms use the same secret key for both encryption and decryption. Asymmetric algorithms, which is another way for public key cryptography algorithms, asymmetric, use one key for encryption and a different but somehow related key for decryption. So two different keys, they're not random keys, but they're related in some way. Usually they require that asymmetric algorithms that it's hard, computationally infeasible, practically impossible, if you know the algorithm and you know one of the keys, to find the other key. Sometimes it's useful to, have, to be able to use the keys in opposite orders, but we'll ignore that last point. We'll come to it when we need it. So, we have now have two keys. Encrypt with one, decrypt with the other. And the requirement is that if I know an algorithm, I know one key, it should be hard for me to be able to determine or calculate the other key. So in fact we have two keys, we talk about a key pair. And one's a public key and one's a private key. So we talk about a public-private key pair. And in most systems, the way that it works, each user in that system has their own, care, own key pair. So we denote that for user A, they have two keys, the public key of user A and the private key of user A. So the private key of Steve and the public key of Steve. I have my own key pair. You have your own key pair. Everyone has their own key pair. Often created by yourself. And we'll see the ways for creating them later. They're not random numbers. Okay, the, the key values are not random numbers. They are uh, related somehow. A public key, as you guessed by the name, it can be made public. That means if I have my public key and private key, the two values, I can tell all of you my public key. It doesn't matter. It's available to everyone, anyone who wants it. My private key, again, should be secret. It should be private to me. So I have my key pair, I tell everyone, you, I tell everyone my public key, but I keep my private key secret, I don't tell anyone. That's the assumptions that uh, our keys rely on. And then, all right, let's see these for secrecy and authentication with some pictures. Uh, to explain how we use those keys. So the concept, let's say I want to get a message from A to B confidentially. We have a message M, the plain text. This is user A on the left, user B on the right. We want to get a message from A, from a to B such that no one else in between can read the message. We want confidentiality. Both users have their key pair. So we can say user A has a key pair, user B has a key pair. To achieve confidentiality, what we do, user A on the left takes the message, uses a public key encryption algorithm, E, and uses the public key of the destination. So if user A is sending to B, and they want this message only to be read by B, then user A encrypts the message using the public key of B in this encryption process. And the result we can write as we encrypt using the public key of B, message M, and we get some ciphertext as output. We send the ciphertext across the network. 
the destination B receives the ciphertext and to decrypt they use their corresponding private key. If a message was encrypted with B's public key, our algorithm should be such that it will only successfully decrypt with B's private key, or the other key in the key pair. So what B does, they take the ciphertext C, their private key, PRB, and decrypt using our algorithm. And if our algorithm is designed correctly, they'll get the original message as an output. So we'll get the plain text back. So if we want to have confidentiality with public key encryption, and this is an important point to remember, the concept is always encrypt with the destination's public key. We'll look at the algorithms for E and D uh, in this topic, but the concept in general is you encrypt with the destination's public key, and the destination decrypts with their private key. And because, why does it work? Well, the keys should be related in such the way that it will only successfully decrypt if we use the other key in the key pair. We have a key pair, P-U-B, P-U-R, uh, P-R-B. Public key of B, private key of B. If we encrypt with the public, B of, public key of B, we can only decrypt with the private key of B. That's the, the requirements of our algorithm. Now, why does this provide confidentiality? Let's say a malicious user intercepts the ciphertext. They have C. They want to find M. So they have C. They need to decrypt C using some key. But the nature of the algorithm should be such that we can only decrypt the ciphertext using the other key in the key pair from which it was encrypted. This ciphertext was obtained by encrypting with the public key of B, therefore it will only decrypt with the private key of B. And by definition, the private key of B is known only to B. It's private to B. So a malicious user cannot decrypt because they don't have the private key of B. So no one can intercept and find the original message M unless we know that private key. Only the pro person with the private keys can successfully decrypt. For this to work, we need to design an algorithm such that it will successfully decrypt and a way for generating the keys such that it will work in this manner. So this is just the concept. How does it actually work depends upon the algorithm. But people have designed algorithms that meet these requirements, so it does work. We'll come back to authentication. We can use the keys in the opposite order, but we'll come back to that after we go through an example of an algorithm to see that in use. What have we got? Let's go direct to an algorithm. We'll come back to the applications after we see a detailed example. Let's get to one. And the most common and maybe the first algorithm or one of the first few algorithms that was developed and still used widely today, RSA. We're going to go through it in detail, see how it works, and we may see another algorithm in a little bit less detail a little bit later, maybe after the midterm. So RSA is one algorithm for public key cryptography. There are others. But this is one of the most widely used algorithms. Where does the name come from? It was developed by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Len Edelman. R, S and A. Okay, so the name comes from the three people who developed this algorithm. So in 1978, these three researchers developed this algorithm and then they started a company to sell products that implemented the algorithm called RSA Security, eventually sold to some other company, so still part of another company now, RSA. Uh, EMC, I think, is the company. 
It's the most widely used public key algorithm. And the way that we think of the plain text and cipher text is uh, integers, numbers. It's a block cipher. We take a block of text, an integer, and we encrypt it using RSA. And commonly it's just used on small inputs, but we'll come to that after we go through how RSA works. So going back to our general approach for public key cryptography, we need an encryption algorithm, we need a decryption algorithm, and we need some way to get the keys. Unlike symmetric key cryptography, the keys must be generated and they are related in some way. In symmetric key cryptography, we normally just create a random key, a random sequence of bits. But here, we have an algorithm for generating the public and private key. Because for the decryption to work, those keys must be related. So with RSA, there's a key generation algorithm. We'll go through the steps. Then there's an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. And we can describe the whole algorithm of RSA on this single slide. Remember back to DES, simplified DES even. If you remember back to that lecture, DES, there are many different algorithms of uh, the, uh, the generating the subkeys, the S boxes, the, uh, the different rounds, and we repeat the rounds with DES, uh, the 16 rounds. Uh, the many large uh, S-boxes and so on. That was quite complex. Encryption with RSA is simply take our message as an integer, raised to some power, mod by n. So conceptually it's very, very easy. It's just doing exponentiation in modular arithmetic, modular exponentiation. And decryption is just as easy. It's the same algorithm, just we vary the numbers that we use. To decrypt some ciphertext, we take the ciphertext, raise it to some power d, mod by n, and we get the original message back. Very simple algorithms conceptually to implement and to uh, a little bit more complex, but compared to our block ciphers, our symmetric block ciphers, uh, much simpler. For this to work, we need to generate the keys correctly. And that's what we'll go through first, the way of generating the keys, and then we'll look at an example that uh, shows how it works. So what happens is that each user in the system generates their own key pair. So imagine every user goes through the key generation steps. And at the result of the key generation, each user has a key pair. Once each user has a key pair, we can encrypt and decrypt using the correct key. So let's go through key generation first. First step to generate your own key pair, what you do is choose two primes P and Q, two prime numbers, and then you calculate N as the multiplication of those two primes. Let's do it in an example. Actually, I don't want that. Let's go through an example where we generate our keys. For the example, we're going to use very small values, just so I can calculate them. We can always do it in our head, but we'll talk later about in practice. So first, RSA key generation. And you think each user does this. They do it independently. So the first step is to choose two prime numbers. P and Q. 
two prime numbers, okay. I'll choose two that I can calculate easily. P17, Q is 11. Okay. We'll talk later about what are the recommended values, especially regarding length. But the concept is the same. And then we calculate N, which is P times Q. We get 187. So that's the first step in generating our keys. The next step, we're going to need the totient of n. We're going to use the totient of n to find some other value e. So let's first work out the totient of n, Euler's totient. What's the value? The totient of n, n in our case is 187. Quickly find the answer. The totient of 187. The totient, remember, that the number of numbers less than 187 which are relatively prime with 187. So we, in the very basic form, we say, all right, number one, is it relatively prime with 187? Or what does relatively prime mean? It means are the two numbers have a greatest common divisor of one. One and 187, greatest common divisor, one. Okay, relatively prime. Two and 187, what's the greatest common divisor? If it's one and relatively prime, 3 and 187, 4 and 187, and so on. What's the answer? How many numbers less than 187 are relatively prime? 160. 160, okay. He calculated quickly. We don't do it the manual way. Okay. We've got a formula that will help us solve this quicker. If we go back to our number theory, one characteristic of the totient of n is that the totient of, I'll just write it here, the totient of a prime number is p minus 1. Because the number of numbers less than that prime, which are relatively prime with that prime, is all of them. So the numbers less than p, there are p minus 1 values. So the totient of a prime is p minus 1. And it can follow from that the totient of two primes multiplied together, remember P, n is just p times q, is the totient of the primes multiplied together. So let's write that. 187, we know, because we just calculated it, is 17 times 11. So do it on the full way. 17 is a is a prime. 11 is a prime because we just chose them that way. So it's equivalent to the totient of 17 times the totient of 11. That's true if they are prime numbers. And the totient of 17 is 17 minus 1. And the totient of 11 is 11 minus 1. So the fact that we chose the primes means we can quickly solve the totient of the multiplication of those two primes. That's going to be needed in step two. Step two is select some value e, some integer e, such that it is relatively prime with a totient of n. And it's stated on the slide here is that e and the totient of n, the greatest common divisor, is 1. Or in other words, the two values are relatively prime. So find an e which is relatively prime with 160. And it should be less than the totient of n. There may be multiple values. Find one. 
Start small. Find an, a, a number that is relatively prime with 160. Small as possible. Uh, sorry, E should be greater than 1 and less than the totient of N. Okay, so not 1. Th there are multiple answers. Okay. So it needs to be a number which has a greatest common divisor with 160 of 1. 7, yeah. So greatest common divisor with 160, it's not going to be an even number. 2 has a greatest common divisor with 160 of 2, so that's not an answer. 3 and 160. 4, 5, 6. Try some numbers. Let's try a few. So uh, we have the totient of 187. Find an E. We want the greatest common divisor of E and 160 to be 1. So an E should be greater than 1 and less than 160. That's the condition. So you can test them, okay? In, in a very simple form. 2 and 160, no. They don't have a greatest common divisor of 1. 3 and 160, yes. That one's okay. 4 and 160, in fact, all of the even numbers have a greatest common divisor, or have a divisor of at least 2. So the, the, we can rule out the even numbers. 5 and 160, greatest common divisor, is it 1 or higher? It's higher. 160 has a divisor of 5. So we cannot use 5. 7? Check. It's OK. 160 will not divide by 7. 7 is a prime number. And we can keep going. 9? I think you'll find 9 is OK. 11? is also okay. There are multiple answers here. Many or multiple numbers between 1 and 160 which are relatively prime with 160. Choose one of them. That's the step 2. And that's the value E in our algorithm. And I would choose because I've got the answer 7. Next. So that was step two. Step one, choose your primes, calculate n. Step two, calculate the totient of n and find e. Select an e. Such that it is relatively prime with the totient of n. Step three, find some d, or calculate d, such that D is the multiplicative inverse of E in the in mod the totient of N. So D times E mod the totient of N should be 1. That's our requirement. Find D. E, I chose a 7. Find D. In other words, E and D are multiplicative inverses. Multiply them together, we get 1 as the answer. When we mod by the totient of N, which is 160. So, E, you're correct, E times D mod our totient of n, 160, should equal 1. E is... 
Let's get rid of E. E is 7 in our case. 7 times D mod 160 equals 1. What value of D? And you can manually try some different values. Okay, so the, the very basic way, 7 times D mod 160 <coughs> equals 1 means 7 times D should be either 161 or 321 or 481 or some other value. Why? Because when we mod by 160, we'll get 1. So that's the basic way. That is, if 7 times D, if it equals 161, then 161 mod 160 gives us 1. Is there an, and remember we're dealing with integers here, is there a D such that multiplied by 7 we get 161? Or in other words, 161 divided by 7, do we get in an integer? Yes. D equals 23. So we've got our new parameter D. There are in fact algorithms for the computer to do this, to solve it quite quickly. To find such a D, it's not so hard to find with, a, with an algorithm. There are algorithms that will do it for us. If you want to do it manually, then basically you look at what number when you multiply with E gives us 161 plus 1, or 2 times 160 plus 1, or 3 times 160 plus 1, because all of those numbers mod 160 will give you 1. We're done. We've generated our key pair. The values which are generally considered our key pair, the public key is E and N, the private key is D and N. <coughs> but in practice, some other values are often stored as well, especially P and Q. They are also private. It depends upon the implementation. But P and Q, P and Q must be kept secret one way to keep them secret is to delete them. You generate them using a computer, two large primes, go through these steps, get your value of E, D and N, then delete P and Q. So then no one can find it. But it turns out to help with the implementations, it's usually useful to keep those values. We use them later. But in, in theory you don't need them, in practice we often do. So let's write down our key pair. And I'll denote as the public key of our user. What do we get? E was 7. N is 187. And the corresponding private key in this pair D is 23, N is 187, the same N. A little bit conflicting in the words or the terminology here. We said the public key is made public. Okay, we can tell everyone. My value of E is 7, my value of N is 187. I can tell everyone once I've generated these. The private key should be kept private. I should keep it to myself, not tell you. But often, because we use N, we also write it in the private key. N is not private. N is public because it's in the public key. But we often write it as part of the private key as well. Because we use it when we do the encryption and decryption. So be careful. There are really three values here. E, N and D. D must be secret. Don't tell anyone your value of D. E and N can be public or, and are made public. But often we write the private key as also including N. So I generate those values. I tell you my public key. Yep. But if you know E and M, can't you calculate D? 
If you know E and N, can you calculate D? Uh, no, if the numbers are big enough. Okay. And, and I think we'll run out of time today, but in the next lecture we'll go through and see, well, what can an attacker do when we have large enough numbers? For today we'll just get to, let's use the algorithm. The next lecture we'll analyse and see, well, why does it work? For now I think we won't get time to see why it works. We'll just see how it works. Uh, how to use it. But you're on the right track that we need to start asking, well, what does an attacker do? We will come back to that. So for now, we've generated a key pair. Everyone does that, generates their own key pair. You tell everyone else E and N, you don't tell anyone D or P or Q. They must be kept secret. Now you want to encrypt some message. Where are we? Here, sorry. Let's say this is the key pair that we've generated for user B. User B did this. And A wants to send a message to B. And we want this message to be secret, to be confidential. What do we do? We have some message, we want to send it to B. What we do is we take that message and we encrypt it using the RSA algorithm. And to keep the message secret, we encrypt it with B's public key. Okay. So to send to someone else, use their public key. What's the message? My message is a complex one. It's 88. The plain text in RSA are just integers. So let's say you have a sequence of bits, like an ASCII message, a hello. You must somehow represent that as integer, just as one number. Because the encryption operation operates on that integer. And that's easy to do. If you have an ASCII, you can create the, uh, the binary form of each letter, H, E, L, L and O, get it in 8-bit values, and then you can combine those uh, 5 8-bit values, you get 40 bits, and that can be your integer. So you can convert any message into a single number. The constraint is that the, the integer M your plain text that you want to send must be less than the number n. Our n is 187, so we have, must have a plain text which is less than 187. So I've chosen 88. What does 88 mean? Nothing in this context, but uh, with a larger example it could have some meaning. And then we use this equation to encrypt. Take your message, raise to the power of e, mod by n, and you get c. So a does that. a wants to send the message to b to encrypt. They use b's public key. The value of e is 7 and n is 187. What's the answer? You can go and do it on pen and paper. Remember last week we showed you how to do the modular multiplication or exponentiation. You can break it into 88 squared three times and then times it by 88. You don't need to do it. I've got the answer for you. I don't know if my calculator will do it. 88 to the power of 7, mod 187, 11. Okay, so we can calculate that. We send that across the network, the value 11. Again, I know it's hard to, to visualise, but the value of 88 is our plain text. 
It has no meaning in this example, but if we had a much larger numbers, we could have the integer to represent any information just by converting that information to binary. We send the ciphertext across the network. B, the receiver, decrypts. And the decryption algorithm is that you take C raised to the power of D mod by N and you should get the message back. Let's try. So B receives to get the message back, let's say M prime, the received value, they take C, 11, raise it to the power of D, D, it was encrypted with B's public key, therefore we decrypt with B's private key, in this case D is 23. N is 187 again. And I need my calculator. 11 to the power of 23 mod 187. Any guesses? 88. Magic. It works. That is, with these numbers at least, when we took 88 raised to the power of E mod by 187 and then took that value and raised it to the power of D, this other number, mod by the same N, we get the original message back. And that's what we need for encryption. We need to be able to encrypt, get ciphertext, and decrypt and get the original plain text. Otherwise it's useless. It worked in this case, it will work in all cases because of the way that we chose those keys, E and D. Why? Right, before we go through why will it work, any questions on the steps so far? Not on how we attack it, but just on how we generate the key and how we encrypt and decrypt. Any questions? So when we have a quiz on Thursday, if we have a quiz then you can encrypt with RSA, decrypt with RSA, generate RSA keys, at least for small values. All right, you need a calculator for this step. Well, you don't really. I could ask you, I wouldn't in a quiz, but I could ask you to solve it manually uh, by expanding it out. You could, but I'm not that mean. Uh, not in a quiz, in an exam, I'm meaner than that. So you may have to solve these manually, but the steps. You should be able to generate your own key pair using small numbers like I've just chosen. Any questions? First, well, the last thing today, yeah. Yeah. why does it work? If we change M to a different value, will it always produce, when we get the ciphertext and decrypt with D, will we always get M back here? Well, yes, it will. Why? Let's have a quick look. Let's look in general, the equations. Sorry, C we start with. The first equation we have is C equals M to the power of E mod N. And the other equation we have is M, the decryption, is C to the power of D mod N. So let's start with the right one. Let's start here. M, so they are the two equations we have. We want to see if we start with M, encrypt, and then decrypt, will we get the original M back? Start with the right equation and do some substitutions. 
So that's just the right equation, the right-hand side. Now let's replace this C with this C. Okay, we know C equals m to the power of e mod n. Let's call this m m prime, meaning the, the decrypted m. We take our ciphertext, decrypt, and we get m prime. Now let's replace C with the top left equation. C is in fact created by taking m to the power of e mod n all to the power of d mod n. So I've just done a substitution in that case. We can expand this, that is m to the power of e mod n all to the power of d. We have the same properties in normal exponentiation. m to the power of e all to the power of d is what? m to the power of d all to the power of e in normal arithmetic. Equals with normal arithmetic m to the power of e times d. The same applies in modular arithmetic. And you can check and go back to our properties to see that. m to the power of e to the power of d is the same as m to the power of e times d. Mod n. Mod n. Well, we don't really need that. All I did was effectively bring this d inside here m to the power of e to the power of d is m to the power of e times d mod n and we have the second mod n but note if you mod n multiple times it's the same as modding n one time 12 mod 10 is 2 mod 10 is 2 mod 10 is 2 if you keep modding 10 you'll still get 2 so it doesn't matter how many mod n's we have here, it's equivalent to just to one mod n. So it simplifies to m to the power of e times d mod n. So, if we take our original message m, raise it to the power of e times d mod n, we get m prime. Our encryption and decryption will work if m equals m prime. That's our requirements for successful decryption to get the original m back. So it leads to the question is in what conditions does m equal m prime? If you take some number, raise it to the power of e times d, and mod by n, you get that same number as an answer. If we have those conditions, then our decryption works. And I'll write that a different way. Uh, yeah, one of our theorems from the previous topic is going to help us. Let's write it differently, but just change the variables. Instead of m prime, we require m prime and m to be equal. Let's say we require something like this. a equals a to the power of something, e times d, mod n. When do we have such a condition? And this will be our last thing we look at. I have to go back to last topic, which will give you the answer. Here. When does a to the power of something equal a in mod n? When that something is the totion of n plus 1. 
So we will use this theorem to find the conditions when RSA algorithm works. But we've run out of time. So the next step, what we'll do is we'll take this algorithm and we'll use it to find the last two conditions. That if we think of that as the Toshin al the, the theorem was like this. Toshin at the end. Almost the same. When are, when are these two equations the same? When are these the same? When E times D equals the totion of N plus 1. If we have E times D equals the totion of N plus 1, let's finish today. I mean, let's spend another minute to finish. Those two will be the same if this is true. When is this true? Well, when E times D mod the totion of N equals 1. That is, mod this by the totion of N and you get the left side. Mod this side by the totion of N, divide by the totion of N, the remainder is 1. The totion of N plus 1, mod the totion of N, there's one left over. So that's our condition for when RSA will decrypt. And if you go back to the key generation, we have this condition. We chose a D such that when we times by E and mod by the totion of N, we got one. So the way that we generated the keys made sure that this condition was true which makes sure RSA decrypts successfully. So that's the way to show that RSA always works if you generate the keys in that that's approach with the algorithm we, we use. That's a bit involved. Try and understand, make sure you know the key generation, encryption and decryption and then try and understand the concepts behind why RSA works. What we'll do next lecture is attack RSA. If we're the malicious user, how can we find the plain text given the ciphertext, or even better, how can we find the key, the private key, given just the public key or the ciphertext? We'll do look at that next lecture. Everyone's awake? Good. If you're interested in RSA, uh, you may have seen, or in security in general, sorry, I've got it somewhere, you may have seen in the news last week and this week and the technical news that people have come up with ways to break RSA. Researchers cracked the world's toughest encryption, they're referring to RSA, by listening to tiny sounds made by your computer or your CPU. The setup is a laptop here, decrypting with RSA, a microphone, it listens in to the CPU, actually listens to the noise it makes and it comes out of the fan of the, the, the laptop and then from that they determine the secret key just by listening to the CPU from a distance of one to four meters. It works and if you're interested this week I'm going to give a presentation, maybe at a lunchtime break, because there's no one, no one has any free time, about how it works. So I'll send out an announcement tomorrow maybe. It's not required to attend, only if you're interested in knowing how, knowing how it works. It will most likely be Friday lunchtime. Then we'll, I'll give some plots and some results from their paper that show how that works. Okay, that will be breaking RSA. It's not needed for the lecture, only if you're interested.